and this morning's topic is the community of baptism. Uh, today I'm joined by my colleague and friend, Professor Lyle Birma. He is Emeritus Professor of Historical Theology at Calvin Theological Seminary. He is an expert on Reformed Confessions, most notably the Heidelberg Catechism. He is the author, among other works, of The Covenant Theology of Caspar Olevianus and The Theology of the Heidelberg Catechism, a Reformation Synthesis. And most recently, and significantly for this session, he has published a book called Font of Pardon and New Life, John Calvin and the Efficacy of Baptism. And we have a copy out on our table over there if you want to look at it. He will start off our session today with a focus on Calvin's theology of baptism, and then I will follow with uh, insights regarding the practice of baptism in the early modern worship. So, Lyle. Thank you, Kareen. Good morning, everyone. Am I coming through okay? Okay, great. My topic this morning is the theology of baptism that emerged from the Protestant Refor Reformation in 20 minutes. <laughs> <laughs> and that's a tall order, as you can about imagine, not only because of the limited time that we have, but also because there was no single theology of baptism that emerged from the Protestant Reformation. And that's partly related to the fact that there was no single Protestant Reformation. More and more, I would say over the last two or three decades, scholars are talking about the Protestant Reformations in the plural. In fact, one of the textbooks that I used when I used to teach at the undergraduate level, going back to the 90s, by Carter Lindbergh, published in 1996, the European Reformations. So, how do you talk then about the theology of baptism that emerged from the Protestant Reformation when you have that diversity of Reformations? Just to draw this out, we're going to have to limit ourselves, but just to draw out what we're talking about here, if you look at these various reformations on uh, spectrum here, if you have the uh, Roman Catholic Church at the right here, and then you see various Protestant traditions moving away from the Roman Catholic Church, you have the Lutheran Reformation, the Wittenberg Reformation there. That's not very sh sharp. We'll try Let's shift to green. Uh, then next you have, uh, a little farther away, the Genevan Reformation under Calvin and Beza. You have uh, the Zurich Reformation, Zwingli and Bulliger and so on. And then you have, at the far end, the Radical Reformation, the largest group of which was the Anabaptists. And this is just on the continent. I haven't even talked about the English Reformation yet. So we have to make some choices here about what we're going to cover when we talk about the theology of baptism that comes from the Protestant Reformation. And guess what? I'm going to choose this one. <laughs> <laughs> couple, a couple of reasons. Uh, first of all, we are, after all, in the meter center for Calvin studies. So if we don't talk about Calvin sometime in the next 20 minutes, these walls will probably cave in on us at some point. <laughs> But also, I'm, I'm choosing this one because of where it's positioned on this spectrum here. It sort of stands right in the middle. And Calvin, I think, is a good representative of the theology of baptism that emerges from the Protestant Reformation because he has kind of a centrist position. He's always trying to steer his way between folks on this side and folks on this side. So if you want to get a sense of what's kind of a center position or a central moderate position, it would be uh, Calvin and uh, the Genevan Reformation. So that's why we're going to focus largely on Calvin, although Calvin's theology of baptism will overlap with some of the others as well. One more point before I get into the theology of baptism itself, and that is we should remember that Calvin and the other reformers did not erase the medieval Catholic tradition. The Reformations were not a reset. They were a reformation of what they had inherited from the medieval past. They reshaped it, they reformed it, but they didn't completely obliterate it and start over from scratch. They 
both therefore retained certain aspects of the medieval tradition and they made some significant changes to the medieval tradition, including with the doctrine and practice of baptism. So what I'd like to do in just the next few minutes is look briefly, first of all, at common ground that you find between Calvin and the medieval tradition that he inherited. Where is there convergence or overlap between them? And then we'll shift in the second part to the divergences, the changes, the reshaping, the reformation that is going on when it comes to the theology of baptism. And then I'll turn it over to uh, Corrine Mogg for some material on the practice of baptism. So I'm going to be in the clouds and she'll bring it down to earth pretty soon. You know. <laughs> First of all, then, let's look at some common ground between Calvin and others of the Reformers and the medieval Catholic tradition. And I'd like to identify four areas of common ground between them. First of all, baptism for both the Catholics and the Reformers, particularly Calvin, is theocentric. It has its center in God. It is God-centered. Baptism, after all, according to medieval Catholics and Calvin and so on, we should remember it was instituted by Jesus Christ. So God is the one who institutes baptism. It was commanded by Jesus Christ. Go and make disciples of all nations and so on, baptizing them into the name. And it should, according to Calvin and the medievals, be viewed then as first and foremost an action of God, something that God is doing. It is primarily God who is the actor, the agent in baptism. It is God primarily who is saying something in baptism and who is doing something in baptism, not to the total exclusion of the person being baptized, but the focus or the emphasis in baptism is on the action and on the speech of God. So that's a first area of commonality between Calvin and the tradition that he inherited. Second, the sacrament of baptism is a, a joining sacrament, if you will. The name of this session, this particular session, is Joining the Community of Worship. And baptism was the way that an individual joined that community of worship. It's the official entrance for the Christian into the church community and the entrance of the Christian into the Christian life. So secondly, it is a sacrament of joining, joining the Christian community. Third, and this was something that was held by really all the Reformation traditions with the exception of the Anabaptists, and that is that baptism is to be administered to the children of believers and not just to adult converts to Christianity. And fourth, and finally, baptism, says Calvin, along with the medieval tradition, baptism is a means of grace. It is an instrument by which God communicates the blessings of salvation to us. This is probably best summarized by Calvin himself in his Catechism of the Church of Geneva, which came out in 1542 in the French edition and then 1545 in the Latin. And so what I'm quoting here is actually an English translation of the Latin version of the catechism. And this was question 328. This is a long <laughs> And we're not even to the end yet, so this is a long one. Think of if you were a child in those days and had to memorize these things, but anyhow. Um, in question 328, Calvin asks, or not Calvin, but the minister, could be Calvin, the minister asks, but do you attribute nothing more to the water of baptism than that it is only a symbol of washing? Is baptism, baptismal water just a symbol? And the child then responds in this way, 
I think it to be such a symbol that reality is at the same time attached to it. For God does not disappoint us when He promises us His gifts. Hence, it is certain that pardon of sins and newness of life are offered to us and received by us in baptism. That's where I got the title for my book on Calvin and the efficacy of baptism, Font of Pardon and New Life. Hence, it is certain that pardon of sins, forgiveness of sins, and newness of life are offered to us and received by us in baptism. It is through the means or instrument of baptism for Calvin and the medieval tradition that grace is offered to us and received by us. In baptism, we are incorporated not just into the church, into the community, we are incorporated into Christ Himself. Okay, those are four areas of common ground between the Catholic tradition and Calvin and some of the other reformers as well. Baptism is theocentric, it's a joining sacrament, it's to be administered to the children of believers, and it is a means of grace. Uh, one nice way of summarizing those points, at least three of those points, not the one about the children, but three of those points is a quotation from a document that came out in 2007 out of the United States Catholic Reformed Dialogue. This was an ecumenical dialogue that Catholics in the United States and various Reformed denominations were involved in going all the way back to the 1960s, to the time after Vatican II. And Sue Rosebaum and I both had the privilege of representing our denomination, the denomination we're a part of, on that dialogue. And we spent uh, from 2003 to 2010 talking about just the sacraments. The first part of that was on baptism, 03 to 07, and then the rest on the Lord's Supper. But what, what we produced at the end of our discussions on baptism was a document called These Living Waters, Common Agreement on Mutual Recognition of Baptism, a report of the Catholic Reform Dialogue in the United States, 2003 to 2007. And a significant part of that document was identifying theological affirmations that we found we both could adhere to, that were areas of common ground between us. And I'll just read one of those, the very first one. Um, which I think nicely summarizes at least three of the four points that I was making already about commonality between the traditions. Quote from that document, Baptism is a sacrament of the church in which a person is effused with or immersed in water, accompanied by the Trinitarian formula that the person is baptized into the name, in or into the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, Matthew 28, 19, and 20. Baptism is the first of the sacraments that a person receives. It is a means of grace through which God works in a person and that marks the reception of a person into the life and mission of Christ's church. Both Catholics and Reformed Protestants signed off on that statement. If Calvin and the Catholics of his day had been at that dialogue, I think they would have signed off on this also. But they didn't agree on everything. And so what I'd like to do now is briefly identify four areas of divergence or difference between the Catholic tradition out of which Calvin came and uh, his own theology of baptism. Number one, baptism, says Calvin, does not save a person ex opera operato. That is, by virtue of the act that is performed, by virtue of the baptismal act itself, it does not save. Baptism for Calvin is a means or an instrument of saving grace, but it does not itself save the person being baptized. According to Calvin, uh, the Roman Catholic tradition had led people to believe that there was saving power in the sacramental elements and the sacramental action themselves, that they themselves had the power to transform. Baptism itself washes away 
original sin in the person being baptized. So if that was the case for the Catholic tradition, the sac sacrament of baptism then was absolutely necessary for a person to be saved. And in cases where a child is born and appears likely to die very quickly, it was necessary then to baptize that, ch that child on the spot if one could be assured that they were saved, if they were to be saved. And so the Catholics came up with this idea of emergency baptism. And that could be done by anyone who did it in the right way. It could be done by the midwife who is delivering the baby. It could even be done by a person who's not Catholic or not a Christian. It could be done by a non-Christian even, so long as they followed certain protocols. Because baptism is what saves and it's absolutely necessary for salvation. Calvin pushed back on that. Calvin says that baptism is very important. It's a very important sacrament, but it is not itself the saving agent, and therefore it is not absolutely necessary in order for a person to be saved. So that's one way in which they diverge. Baptism does not save a person ex opera operato, the Latin for by virtue of the act itself that is performed. That needs further explanation, and that gets more explanation in these subsequent points. Number two, another, a second important area of divergence. Baptism, says Calvin, is effective, efficacious, only in connection with the Word and the Holy Spirit. It's effective only in connection with the Word and the Holy Spirit. Calvin and others of the Reformers felt that these connections to the Word and Spirit had been largely lost in the medieval tradition, and they were really trying to restore them. Baptism, uh, say, says Calvin and the Reformers, is a visible, and, uh, a visible sign and seal of the Word, of the very promises of the Gospel. We're seeing the Word here in the sacrament. So very tightly connected to the words, the word in another medium, in another form. Therefore, it ought always to be administered, baptism ought always to be administered together with the proclamation of the word. The word must there be, be there present as well as the sacrament itself. Furthermore, if baptism is effective, it's only because of the work of the Holy Spirit. It's only because the Holy Spirit is the one who brings the promises of the Word to fruition within us by means of baptism, with baptism as an instrument or a means of this grace. But it's the Holy Spirit who's the saving agent, not the baptismal elements or action itself. So, baptism is effective only in connection with Word and Spirit. Three a third difference or divergence. And this is another area where the reformers thought something had gotten lost along the way, and that is that the benefits of baptism must be appropriated by faith. The benefits of baptism must be appropriated by faith. That immediately raises the question. I mean, most of the baptisms in the 16th century are done with children. And so right away you say, and the Anabaptists raised this too, right away you say, well, a child doesn't have faith. How can they then appropriate the blessings of salvation? Well, Calvin here followed Luther, at least in the early part of his career, already back in the 1536 Institutes, Calvin followed Luther by talking about infant faith. Children do have faith. They have it in an infant form, but they do have it. So faith is present there when a child is baptized. And then later on, Calvin, uh, he, he backed away from that kind of terminology a bit and talked more about the seeds of faith that you find already in children. Uh, sometimes he would say it as if they're planted in baptism itself, but children having the seeds of faith already. And so he responded to that objection by talking about infant faith in some form. The benefits of baptism must be appropriated by faith. 
And then fourth and finally, baptism, well, let me, yeah, baptism is a communal and a public sacrament, not an individual and a private one. Baptism is a communal and public sacrament, not an individual and private one. It is a sign and a seal of membership in a community. Remember, we're calling this the joining sacrament. You're joining a community here. So it's a sign and seal of membership in a community. A community writ large that has been in a particular relationship, what Calvin talked about is a covenantal relationship. This is where the doctrine of the covenant comes in. A community that's been in a covenantal relationship with God going all the way back to the Old Testament, to the book of Genesis. So the fact that uh, this is a communal and a public sacrament, that's going to have real implications for how baptism then was practiced in the Genevan Reformation. But here I'm bumping up against the practice, and it'll be a good time to hand it over to Kareem Mock. All right, well, good to see everybody here. And again, uh, I'm Karine Mogg. I'm the director here of the Meter Center for Calvin Studies. And it's my great pleasure to be able to speak with you today. So what we're going to do at this point is talk a little more about baptism in practice. And specifically, how did that work when we're thinking about, okay, there's the theology. Now, how does it work when people are actually coming for the sacrament? So our first question to address is, well, who gets baptized? And Professor Birma already addressed the idea that in most of the traditions we're talking about, except for the Anabaptist, we're talking about the baptism of infants. Okay, that seems pretty clear. We're talking about babies. Um, exceptions would be a convert from another faith. Not that common in early modern Europe, but it could potentially happen. Um, really important to understand. And it sort of draws out from the theology that Professor Birma already talked about. These different confessional groups do not rebaptize their members. In other words, if you are Reformed and you convert to becoming Roman Catholic in the 16th century, you do not get rebaptized. If you are Catholic and you become Lutheran, you do not get rebaptized. One baptism. And that Trinitarian baptism is valid across the confessions. Okay, that's really, really important to understand. The uh, exception, however, of course, is the Anabaptists who believed in adult or believer's baptism, right? Um, that has to be done when the person is old enough to make the promises in their own name. Okay, fine. But you can understand very clearly that that first generation of Anabaptists had all themselves been baptized as infants when they were Catholic, right? You understand that, right? So if you become an Anabaptist, you are essentially going for two baptisms, one as a baby and one when you make a believer's baptism. But the Anabaptist said that first one didn't count, okay? This is the real baptism, the believer's baptism. Unfortunately for the Anabaptists, everybody else said, no, 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 you're on baptism number two, and that's wrong. Rebaptism was actually a crime in early modern Europe because you're denying the validity of your original baptism. One of the reasons why the Anabaptists were so heavily persecuted and even executed for their faith was on the grounds of these, what the others understood as re-baptisms and denial of the validity of their original baptism. So it's a big, big problem. All right, who gets baptized? We've talked about that. Where and when does the baptism take place? Well, this is kind of interesting. Um, if you were Catholic, your baptism, assuming you know, you're coming to church to have the baptism done, would mostly take place at the door of the church and right inside where the font was located. Okay, so think of at the entrance because you're joining the community, right? It's at the door that a lot of the ritual happens, okay? Um, it could be done at any time if you were Catholic, right? Usually within a few days of birth. Uh, and it was not connected to an ordinary worship service. In other words, the mass and the baptism are not linked. 
You can have your baptism at any time and separate from a mass, from a general, you know, worship service, if you're Catholic, okay. If you're Lutheran or Anglican or Reformed, the baptism moves into the center of the church and the font moves. It's kind of interesting. Instead of being at the door of the church, the font now moves close to the pulpit because we're linking the word and the sacrament and the preaching takes place at the pulpit. So now you have the font close by. Okay. Um, if you were Lutheran or Anglican, there's actually a font, right? Um, the Reformed didn't tend to go so much for fonts. They would perhaps have a, a, a bowl or a, a ewer or some other container of water that's actually sometimes just hooked onto the pulpit, right? There's a little hook thing and that's where it goes. So again, visually tying the word and the sacrament together, but not as a separate uh, font. Preferably, or in the case of the Reformed, always, baptism had to take place during a regular worship service, not disconnected from it. You need the preaching of the word and the sacrament, and crucially, the presence of the congregation before a baptism is fully valid, right? Because there are promises being made in the presence of the community of God. If you're joining the community, the community needs to be present, okay? So it's a different way of thinking about what that sacrament actually looks like in practice. It moves in terms of where it's located in the church, and it happens in the context of a regular worship service, part of that regular worship service. Uh, if you're Anabaptists, uh, your uh, baptism will take place outdoors often, sometimes in a river or a lake. Um, it could be in a private home. So it, it's sort of a very different setup if you're Anabaptist compared to the other confessional groups we've mentioned so far. Who is present and who is absent? Now that's an interesting question. Who turns up to a baptism? Well, obviously the baby, yeah, we got that. Interestingly, across the board, mothers tended not to be present for baptisms because it happened fairly soon after the baby was born and the mom is recovering. She's at home, okay? She's not at the baptism. In the Catholic uh, system or the Catholic practice of the sacrament, the fathers also were rarely present. And it's the godparents who are there. And it's the godparents who present the baby for baptism. And the idea there was that the father is too connected to the carnal act of creating the baby, and therefore it's not appropriate to have him there at a spiritual sacrament. So, no mom, no dad, godparents. Often also the midwife would be present, and she might actually present the baby, right? The godparents make the promise, the midwife is there. Okay. Well, now we move to Lutheran or Anglican or Reformed, and the pastors there say, yeah, okay, mom's not there, that's fine, we understand that. But uh, in many cases, the presence of the father became increasingly important, that the dad has to be there, because the promises to bring up the child in the faith have to be done by a parent. So you need the father to be there. But it went across traditional practices, where the dad, and in Geneva this happens, you know, Mr. So-and-so has a baby and doesn't turn up to the baby's baptism. And the consistory says, why weren't you there? And he says, well, I was planning the party for after the baptism. That's what I'm supposed to do. I'm, I'm organizing that. And so the, the consistory had to kind of reshape popular understandings of who should actually be present. And crucially, the father needed to be present for the whole of the service, not just duck in for the baptism and duck out again, okay? The whole thing from start to finish, including the preaching, okay? It's, it's, a, it's a package deal. It's not like you go in and you go out again. What rituals form part of the baptism? Another interesting question. Um, generally speaking, the Catholic ritual was the longest and most complex. And it involved several stages of anointing and blessing and um, blowing on the baby to blow out the power of the baby, the, the power of the devil over the baby. Okay, there's all these different phases. I mean, literally an exorcism that happens before the actual baptism itself to uh, push away the power of the devil over the child before the child is baptized. And then the ritual can involve the baptism itself, obviously, then the giving of a candle, the dressing in a white robe. Like there's just lots and lots and lots of steps that take place for the whole baptism itself. Uh, generally speaking, the Lutherans kept many of these traditions. The Reformed, by and large, got rid of them. Okay, the, the Reformed rite is much, much shorter and really is only the water and the naming and the promises. 
but not the anointing, not the exorcism, not the candles, not the white robes, none of that stuff. So it gets kind of shorter as you go. It depends on which, which community you're looking at. Um, Lutherans, again, Luther was very much willing to continue rituals that he saw as adiaphora, not particularly significant one way or the other. They can be retained, they can be rejected. What's fascinating is how uh, important these rituals were for Lutherans, right? That they thought that this was vital as part of the uh, practice of the baptism, the exorcism, the anointing, and so on. And you see this when areas switch from being Lutheran to being Reformed. And this happened in the German lands, for instance, in Brandenburg. Uh, they had been Lutheran, so from about the 1530s right through the end of the 16th century. And then the, there's a ruler in Brandenburg, Johannes Sigismund, and he's Reformed. So he wants to move his whole community from Lutheran to Reformed. And it's not that long that they've been Lutheran, but they're very, very keen on their Lutheran practices, and they don't particularly want to change to Reformed ones. And you see this at baptism. So there's a very well-known story, Bodo Nishan, a, a very famous scholar of this field, um, talks about it. And it's a baptism that takes place in Brandenburg. Okay, it's now Reformed, so there's a Reformed pastor. But there's a Lutheran dad who brings his baby, right? Baby girl, wants the baby girl baptized. And he insists on the whole Lutheran ritual. And he brings his cleaver to church to ensure that the pastor follows through, okay? This is commitment, okay? Not appropriate, but it is commitment. It says something about how people understood the ritual and what was supposed to be part of it, what's proper to be part of it, okay? So in that case, you have a very strong sense that a valid baptism, and this is from a layperson, a valid baptism includes the exorcism, the anointing, that that has to happen, right? Tells you something about how these these practices sort of sink in to popular understandings of what constitutes a valid sacrament. It's fascinating. All right, other questions. So this is actually uh, uh, from the Wittenberg altarpiece. This is actually uh, Philip Melanchthon baptizing a baby. Notice the font. Notice that this is a baptism by immersion. Okay, the baby's going to be ducked into the font. Um, the uh, practice of immersion, generally speaking, was dying out, and more and more people were doing baptism by effusion, like where you pour water on the baby, but not actually ducking them uh, under. It's, it's health-wise, in a cold church, it's just awkward and not necessarily such a good thing. Um, I want to talk a little more about the fact of baptism, not necessarily always as a sacrament, but as how someone is integrated into a community. Right? So this is before anyone has civil registration of births. Right, You don't go register your birth at City Hall. It's when the baby is baptized and given his or her name that they are essentially made a part of the community in a civil way as well as in a religious way. Okay? It's the pastor's baptism registry that serves as the record of births. Do you understand that? It's like total overlap. There's not a separate registration of births that you do somewhere else. So the registry recorded by the clergy is meant to have the name of the parents, the name of the child, the name of the godparents. Um, and it gets to be tricky in cases where the birth is illegitimate, right? Where there's no father or the mother says, well, you know. Uh, so there's, there's, there's quite a push on women to give over that name, um, both for, you know, the the moral reasons of making people atone for premarital sex, but also because uh, it's pretty clear that uh, political and religious authorities want the dads to step up to pay for the upkeep of their children, right? So babies that are not provided for by a dad are often at the charge of the city, and the city doesn't like that, okay? So they want to know, yeah, yeah, who's the dad? He needs to pay for the upkeep. This, this baby has a dad. We want to know who it is. So that's, that's interesting. Naming. All right, now here this is fascinating. What name do you give your baby? All right, so quick question for all of you. Raise your hand if you are named after a relative. Just raise your hand. Okay. Which relative are you named after? My grandfather. Your grandfather. You have the same first name or middle name or both? Uh, I have his middle name. Middle name. Okay, so his middle name is your first name. Okay, another hand, someone else. Okay, go ahead. There you go. Another kind of combination there. Other ones? Yes, go ahead. 
So it's a way of honoring family. People do that, right? You meet so-and-so junior, so-and-so the third, okay? It's a way of honoring the family, right? Connecting kinship, grandparents, uncles, best friends. You know, there's just ways of doing that. We still do that today, okay? You'll not be surprised to know that this is very common in the 16th century. It's a way of honoring relatives and especially honoring godparents. Naming your child after your godfather or godmother, very important kind of kinship bond connection building. Okay, here's the problem. What name you pick might say something about what tradition you favor. So, in Geneva, by the 1540s, late 1540s, there's a list prepared by the pastors but enforced by the city government of names you may not call your child because these names are too Catholic, okay? So you may not call your baby these names because they're too Catholic. You think, well, what's, what's, a, what's a Catholic name exactly? Well, maybe Mary or Joseph. But in fact, the names that turn up, they don't want you to call your baby after the three wise men. You think, okay, I didn't know the three wise men had names. Yes, they do, apparently. In traditional legend, Melchior, Caspar, and Baltazar. Okay, maybe not your first pick for your baby boys. Okay, you weren't gonna call him Baltazar, but there you go, you have these names, okay? You may not call your baby these names. You may not call your baby Jesus or any variety of Jesus, that's not okay, you can't do that. Uh, you may not call him Angel. Uh, you may not call him any names that the pastors consider just silly. Um, they, they have a list of names that are just kind of ridiculous, you don't call them that. And you may not call your baby Claude or Claudine or Claudette or any variety, you think, well, what's wrong with that? There's a shrine to the Catholic St. Claude right outside Geneva in Catholic Savoy, okay? You may not call your baby any of these names. But here's the problem. The first generation of Genevans who are bringing their babies to baptism, right, in the 1540s, and they wanna call their babies after themselves or after the godparents, well, guess what? All those parents and godparents, they're called Melchior and Balthazar and Caspar and Claude, right? So. You have literally this happen where a baptism takes place. The father is there, the godparents is there, the pastor is there, okay. Pastor takes the baby. He says, by what name shall this child be called? And the father who apparently has not read the edict or not paying any attention says, Claude. And the pastor baptizes the baby, Abraham. <laughs> okay, think about that as a parent, how you would feel. You might be a little irate. You might be a little cranky. There are near riots that take place in baptisms in Geneva in this period. And at one point, one father grabbed his baby back before the baptism was even finished and said, you will not baptize a baby without the, without the name I want to give him. Another pastor went, another father went along with it, seemingly, but then turned around, went home, and had his baby baptized by a midwife with the name he wanted. Okay, so there's a lot of problems there. <laughs> it's a rebaptism, baptism by a woman, name you're not supposed to give. The guy was in a lot of trouble. Okay, this is not a straightforward thing. But, you know, you think, well, it's, it's almost comical, but at the same time what's happening, if you can see, is that two different views are clashing with each other, right? The pastors are worried about resurgent superstition and connecting to Catholicism in an area that's only recently become Protestant. They're very worried about anything that might signal that. And the Genevans are saying, wait, 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 I'm, I'm just calling my baby after Uncle Balthazar. I don't mean anything Catholic by it. I'm just picking a name that connects us, right? So they're, 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 not, they're talking at cross purposes, basically. But it says something about how these sacraments are complex when you look at the actual practice. All right, um, godparents, this is fascinating too. Um, in most reformed communities, at least in North America today, godparents is not very common, right? It depends where you are, but most folks, when you say godparents, they think, well, that's very Catholic, right? I don't do that, I'm not Catholic. Um, godparents persist in reformed communities right through the 16th century. John Calvin was godfather to a ton of babies. There's lots of babies in Geneva called John after him, okay? Um, it was thought of as a good thing in terms of the fact that godparents are supposed to contribute to the spiritual upbringing of the children. Okay, that's what they're there for. They're also there uh, in cases of the mortality, the death of the parents, that godparents meant to play a role in being the guardian for the child, right? Okay, and it is always a, um, a bond of patronage. Okay, you pick someone to be godparent who's influential right, because they can help your child when their child is bigger, okay? And that persists in reformed areas as well as in Lutheran areas 
and in Catholic areas. So, and, and right through up to the modern times, right? My dad is Swiss from Zurich. He had godparents. I was baptized in Zurich. I have godparents. And they're all Reformed, right? It's all within the Reformed Church. So the Zurich Reformed Church has retained the practice of godparents in baptism. And that's, that's just very, they don't think of it as weird or Catholic or something else. It's just part of what they do. All right. A few special circumstances to talk about. Private baptisms. Okay, so we've said that for the Reformed, for the Lutherans, for the Anglicans in general, the emphasis is on baptism in worship, okay, during a regular worship service with preaching. However, there are still parents who much prefer a private baptism at home. And particularly you see that pressure as the social status is more and more up there, right? So a, 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 a child of the nobility someone heir to a princedom. Are you sure you want to bring them to a drafty cold church with lots of peasants sneezing all over them? Okay, it doesn't sound very safe. My precious baby, right? So there's a my precious baby feeling where some parents, regardless of what the church says, still hold out for a private baptism, still hold out for a baptism done safely at home in a warm space, and the pastor comes to us. We don't have to go out to the church. So again, the Church teaching and the popular practice don't always fully align. There's still a pressure for private baptism, even in reformed areas. Um, it's, it's, it's not uncommon. Uh, the pastors had a hard time with that, of course, again, because the presence of the congregation was thought to be vital. So you have to kind of figure out a way of compromising, perhaps, sometimes, how that would actually look. The other one I want to talk about is emergency baptisms. And this is a uh, an 18th century engraving, and it says, baptism administered by a midwife, and the baby is actually here in this lady's lap, and that's the midwife baptizing the baby. Um, emergency baptisms were accepted by Catholics, by Anglicans, by Lutherans, in cases where the baby is at risk of death. Um, it was usually carried out by a midwife, midwives were licensed and trained, and part of their training involved knowing how to do a baptism in the name of the Trinity, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, with water on the baby's head. Okay, it's part of their official training. It's what they need to do in an age of high infant mortality. It was thought of as pastorally and uh, theologically important, especially for Catholic families, uh, absolutely. The Reformed rejected the practice of infant baptism, of emergency baptism. They say, no, we're not doing emergency baptisms. Uh, it's not valid. It's not done properly. Uh, it has to be done in church. It has to be done by the pastor. And again, the reform taught that baptism itself is not properly salvific. So if your baby dies without being baptized, you should not fear that your baby is somehow lost. They are not lost. They are part of the covenant community of God, and therefore they are not lost even if they were not baptized. That transition is hard for people. It takes a long time for people to be comfortable with that idea. Right? So you do find parents in the first generations of reformed areas still doing everything they can. Some midwives are still doing emergency baptisms, even if they're not supposed to. Um, some parents, and I've seen this even in Geneva, take a baby who was either born dead or died very shortly after birth, and they take them out of Protestant Geneva to the nearest Catholic chapel. There's a number of these, which are, are special chapels where the thought is the baby revives long enough to be baptized. Right? and you have families doing this. And the consistory is very upset with them, but pastorally you can totally understand where these families are coming from, right? They've been taught all their lives that baptism is vital, and now they're being told, oh, it's okay. Yeah, that's not obvious, that change. That is not an obvious change for people to, to grasp that change over. Um, churching, now, this is not really baptism, but it's part of the bigger story of baptism. Churching actually involves the women, the mothers we haven't really talked about so far. Right? Churching was a ritual done in Catholic, Lutheran, and Anglican churches for mothers after childbirth, right? maybe four to six, six weeks after they've given birth. And it was essentially a short service, um, not happening during a regular church service, but privately, perhaps the woman and some of her friends. And it's a service of thanksgiving and blessing, okay? Thanksgiving for her life, thanksgiving for the birth of the child, and in some ways also reintegration into the community, right? So these, these rituals would happen around the altar, around the table, um, a way of giving thanks for the woman's life, for the new birth of her child, 
and for her reintegration into the community. Uh, you will still find the liturgy for it if you look at the Anglican Book of Common Prayer. It's still in there. Um, not practiced very much today, but kind of an interesting sort of bookend to the whole baptism story. All right, we've been moving right along. Um, I want to give you a time to ask some questions, share your insights, things you're wondering about, either things that I've said or that Professor Birma has said. Um, it's your chance to ask us some questions. Yes, go ahead. Sorry if I missed this, but the church in, you said it was Southern Catholic Lutheran or anything, but were they reformed? So the question was, are they, do the reformed do the churching? No, they do not. They have dropped that out um, pretty much entirely. Uh, they did not see a reason for the ritual, I think, and just omitted it. But there's a lot of aspects of ritual that really women were part of that the reformed get rid of quite clearly. Um, you know, all the female saints are gone. You know, there's, you can't uh, pray to St. Anne, who is really the patron saint of pregnant women. You know, that's all gone. And so the churching ritual disappears as well, and it's not something that was practiced. Other questions? Yes. Mm -hmm. I'm wondering, well, I have two questions. One's kind of it's just silly. I want if John Calvin was godparent to so many, did he ever have to like take on when their parents passed away? So, first question about John Calvin as godparent, and did he have to take on uh, the responsibilities for any children? We do know of letters that Calvin sent recommending youngsters that were ones that he had been godparent of, uh, but we don't know of him like taking in. God's children specifically into his home, although it's hard, we don't have like 100% records of what was going on. Um, it would not have been uncommon for sure for him to have to do something for these God children, uh, to recommend them to a post, maybe to provide them with a bit of money if they need a dowry and so on. But I'm not aware of him taking in like hordes of kids into his house because all their parents died or something like that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, and then is it necessary as well that the godparents would be a couple that's married? Okay, good question. So what are the standards for a godparent? Um, no, you didn't have to have the godparents married. In fact, people tended to have different numbers of godparents depending actually on the sex of the baby. So if it's a girl, you have more godmothers than godfathers. And if it's the reverse, you have more godfathers than godmothers. Uh, there's some restrictions about how many you can have because some parents really wanted to kind of pile up the godparents. Every godparent is another kinship link, so the more the better, right? So the authority is saying, whoa, 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 limit this a little bit. Um, you can't have as many as, as you want. You have to kind of be normal about this. Um, the godparents' role was not so much to be a couple, but to be the spiritual... Uh, mentors for the child. They're the ones who take the promises in the child's name. So they are the ones who will then hopefully encourage the child eventually then to seek admission to the Lord's Supper when they're old enough, uh, usually about ages 13, 12, 13, 14, something like that. So they have a role in the spiritual upbringing of the child. They do not themselves need to be a married couple. They do usually have to be members in good standing of the church, right? So, in fact, some people get in trouble when they want a godparent who's of a different confession, right? I want my friend who's Catholic to be a godparent to my reformed child. No, that's not okay. That doesn't happen. Um, and so that there can be sort of strictures there, especially in places where two confessional groups are running up against each other. Um, there are also problems even just attending the baptism of another, of a child who's in a different confessional group. If you're reformed, can you attend a Catholic baptism in France or vice versa? Eh, there's tensions around that. The, the, the pastors are generally not in favor of that because it's almost like you're, you're supporting that denomination if you do that. So they're, they're, they're kind of trying to keep people a little bit apart. The popular mind, however, is much more into, well, that's you know, my nephew and I want to go attend the baptism. Yeah? yeah. Good. Other questions? Yes. Uh, regarding uh, baptism and uh, saving grace and all of that, mm -hmm. um, would it be correct to say, and I'm going to give you two options that are both different, um, is it correct to say that baptism is necessary but not sufficient, or would you say that baptism is desirable but not necessary, nor is it sufficient? I think that's a question for uh, Professor Birma. <laughs> You want to come up and you want to hear the question again? Try it again. Make sure we've understood it. Oh, sure. Um, uh, baptism, uh, option one, uh, baptism is necessary but not sufficient for salvation. Or baptism is desirable but not sufficient 
nor necessary for salvation. In other words, uh, is baptism a necessary uh, part, part of salvation in reformed thinking? So, the simplest version of it, is baptism necessary for salvation in the reformed tradition? Yeah, and the simple answer is no. <laughs> um, it's, it's a requirement, if at all possible, but there are always going to be situations where a baptism might be impossible. And so we leave, I mean, I'm, I'm kind of talking through Calvin's mouth here now, but we leave that to the sovereign work and the sovereign grace of God to bring about the salvation of that child. Because the only requirement to get into the kingdom of heaven is that you be born again. And God can bring about that rebirth even apart from the means that he ordinarily uses. So when we're talking about, at least from Calvin's point of view, of baptism as an instrument or means of grace, that's under ordinary circumstances. There may be extraordinary circumstances in which God can accomplish the same thing apart from those ordinary means. And that was intended to be then comfort for parents whose child died before yeah. they were yeah. baptized. Yeah. Right? right? Which is otherwise a very traumatic experience, you know, physically, emotionally, and spiritually. Right? That's where it was said it's not, you know, it's not going to bar this child from the kingdom of God. Yeah. Yeah. And on the flip side, it, I'm sorry. Go ahead. Go ahead. Yeah. Well, on the flip side, uh, marching um, an army through a river as they did in the early days of the church to baptize them, that is not sufficient. I mean, the, the reformers would say in general that that is not sufficient to create faith. Uh, you have to be taught, you have to be catechized, you have to learn about your faith. You can't just get it by being walked through a river. No, I would say that would, the reform would have significant problems. They certainly would not, on the basis of walking through a river, then admit you to the Lord's Supper. Right. If you think about that, that, that has a teaching part, part to it that needs to happen. Yeah, and Calvin talked about infant baptism too as kind of the beginning of a long salvific process that takes place. He even talked... He didn't use this term, but and he really talked in terms of kind of a delayed efficacy sometimes, whereas the, the salvation process is initiated in the baptism of the child, but then it grows like a seed uh, over a long period of time and comes to fruition at a later point. Yeah. So, Thank you. Yeah. Okay, so, yeah um, a comment and then a question based on what you just said. So first my comment, um, just because Calvin would say, because he says the same thing with regard to the Lord's Supper. This is the ordinary means by which God communicates God's grace, by which God um, provides the only food for our souls, namely Christ's body and blood, somehow incomprehensibly by the work of the Holy Spirit with attached to, if you will, these elements. This is the, or, do you have to, have, is it absolutely, no. There are extraordinary circumstances, but those extraordinary circumstances ought not invite us to diminish our understanding of the significance of this great gift that God has given. So don't spurn, right? It's not, don't spurn this amazing gift that God has given by way of baptism and by way of um, the Lord's Supper, by thinking, oh, I guess they're not all that important. And then you had a question? Um, very important. Yep. Okay, so with regard to um, godparents, in some traditions, it's very explicit that the godparent um, speaks, if you will, mm -hmm. on behalf of the infant mm -hmm. at baptism. But is that the case with regard to the Reformed tradition? So the promises are made and answered, and usually in the Reformed tradition, it would then be the father taking those promises. Right, the godparents are present. Right, but the but the questions are addressed to the parent, to to the parent or the godparent, but it's not necessarily um, speaking with respect to that infant's faith, is it? Um, it's hard to tell. As a proxy. Right, it's sort of a, it's it's tricky to tell, right? Because they don't say you the baby or you the parent. They just ask the question, right? Who is the question directed to? Well. It's the adult who answers on behalf of the child. So it's not saying, you the parent, what do you say? You the infant, how do you feel? It's you, here's the question. Okay. So how do you know, are they meaning the 
proxy or are they meaning the child or are they asking about the faith of the godparents? That's not entirely clear. Okay. Um, but clearly they want the child to be brought up within that reformed confession, yeah. right? Yeah. So having godparents who can testify to their own faith is obviously important right. because that's what assures then the context of faith for that child who is growing up in that faith. So yes, there has to be some sense in which what is being asked about is the faith of the parents and the godparents. Yeah. But at the same time, the idea is that this child is being brought up within the covenant of faith. So Absolutely. that is going to be something that the seed has to be planted, yeah. right? So, but, you know, how do you actually determine which one they're addressing is, is, can be a little challenging. Yeah. Lyle, in your study on Calvin, has, did you experience that question addressed at all? Or even, even implicitly? In my study on Calvin, did I see the question of the godparents speaking, speaking as a proxy, uh, if you will? No, no, I didn't encounter okay. that at all. You don't? If I may add, uh, uh, from the Anglican side of it, it is in the Book of Common Prayer. Yes. The interrogation is to the godparents. So even um, even the renunciation of the devil and everything, uh, the pastor asks, "Do you renounce to the baby?" But then the godparents uh, are, are the ones answering that. Right. Mm -hmm. Yeah. But I, so I don't know about the kind of a proxy. Back. Yeah, a proxy, yeah. Mm -hmm. but, but that's from the Anglican side yeah. of, of the mm -hmm. yeah. Have you yeah. checked mm -hmm. on that Karen Spearling's book on infant baptism no, in Geneva? I okay. Had, but I just yep. haven't had a chance yeah. to That like, might be really a place really to look, yeah. right? Yeah. Yeah. I mean she looks yeah. at all, the practice about infant baptism in Geneva okay. yeah. in a whole book. So yeah. Thank you. Go ahead. Can I ask a clarification question to Professor Gannon? Yes. Um, Sorry, I'm going up and down because I got a bum <laughs> knee, so I, my knee doesn't like it when I stand too long on it, so go ahead. When you spoke about the four things of common ground um, yeah. regarding baptism, the fourth one you said was the means of grace, right? and that it was a reality attached to a symbol. Um, is that something that was common ground among everybody on the spectrum? Because I know that Zwingli, at least with the Lord's Supper, was closer to merely a symbol, or closer to like symbolic and less to reality attached. So I was just curious, does that still apply to all these variations or was it more Geneva and the medieval tradition? Commentary? Yeah, so the question is when Calvin talks about reality, or forgiveness and new life attached to the symbol, is that something that would be held by all the different Reformation confessions or only Geneva and the medieval Catholic Church? So I would say, it goes that far and then stops. <laughs> this is where the line is drawn on that one. And depending what aspect of baptism we're talking about, you know, it, sometimes it you know, goes here and sometimes there and so on. That's why it's so difficult to pin it down to one theology. So, so Zurich is, uh, Zwingli and Zurich tradition would have been closer to, it's, it's more merely a symbol. Yeah, yeah. Just like with the I mean, right. It gets a little more complicated than that. But yeah, that, I mean, that's, Zwingli's yeah. big interlocutor when it comes to baptism is the Anabaptists, right? That's who he's talking with or against when he talks about baptism. So for him, his big point really is that baptism is the Christian uh, version or equivalent of circumcision. And that's his big thing because he's trying to defend infant baptism. And the, the covenant. Correct. Covenant, exactly. Right? Exactly. So it's. Go ahead. Well, I'm saying Zwingli operates with a strong dualism between the spiritual and the physical, between the flesh and the spirit. So anytime you're trying to attach those, he, he gets very uncomfortable. Yeah. Other questions or comments? I want to show a couple of our rare books. So hang on a second. I'll be right back. So the nice thing about when you look at baptism is we have most of the baptism liturgies in one form or another because liturgies survive very nicely. Catechisms, incidentally, finding a 16th century catechism is sometimes difficult and find, finding the actual catechism itself because they're used by young hands and young hands are grubby and dirty and, and the books fall apart, okay? Liturgies tend to survive better. They're used by pastors, they're kept carefully, and so on and so forth. So this is actually a facsimile edition of 
Calvin's liturgy, it's called La Forme des Prières, the Form of Prayers, 1542. This is a facsimile edition. And in it, it's, it's quite a wonderful little book, by the way. It has the salt Psalms at the front, not all of them, because in 1542, they hadn't yet done all the Psalms. We're going to talk about that next in our next session. Um, but then after you get the Psalms, you then get different orders of worship. You get the order of worship for Sundays in general, and then they tell you how to do the baptism and how to do the Lord's Supper, right? So it's like the service book for the church. And most every denomination, every confessional group in the 16th century had something like this, right? So if you're John Knox, you create a form of worship, an order of worship for the Scottish Presbyterians. They have that. The Lutherans obviously have one. The Anglicans have one. Everyone has a liturgy. So you can do comparative studies of baptism practices. And that's how I know that the liturgy gets shorter and shorter, right? If you're Catholic versus by the time you get to Reformed, because we have their liturgies. We know what were the parts that needed to be part of that service. So you can almost recreate the liturgy of baptism simply by looking at the text. That's, that's what's really nice. That's kind of cool. The other thing I want to talk about and show you is this one, okay, again, not a 16th century binding, okay? This is the Calvin's Institutes, okay, Calvin's Institutes of the Christian Religion. Um, we do not have a 1536 edition. We would love one. If you ever find one, let us know. Um, uh, 1536 was the first edition, right? Calvin did that as a very young man, um, and it was really his attempt to write primarily to an audience in France, and especially as he dedicated it to the King of France, right? showing the king of France that these reform folks had a solid theology clearly worked out and that they weren't, you know, wild-eyed fanatics. Um, it's, it's almost an apology in sense of a defense of the reformed faith. And it was really quite short, right? It was a relatively short book. He then reworked it, right, through his life, different editions, Latin editions, French editions. Fascinatingly, the French and the Latin editions are not identical, right? Calvin thought in French and he thought in Latin. He did not translate his Latin into his French, right? He works in both languages, right? The content is the same. I'm not saying the theology is different, but you cannot say like a 100% sentence by sentence that it matches from the French to the Latin. He explains things often more simply in the French, which makes total sense, right? He's talking to a different audience. Okay, so 1559, this is the whole Institutes. Today, if you get a modern edition off our shelves, you're often getting a two volume set, you know, the battles. That's kind of two volumes, right? But it's beautiful. Okay, this is 1559. You can come and look at it afterwards. Um, you've got the printer's mark. This is uh, Robert Etienne, uh, Robert Stephanus, to give him his Latin name. He was the royal printer in Paris until he became reformed and then had to leave. And he took all his materials, lock, stock, and barrel, his printing press, the whole nine yards, and he moves from Paris to Geneva, right? So Geneva gets the royal printer of France as one of their converts and joining the, the growing printing industry in Geneva. So it's a beautiful, beautiful book. Um, his printer's mark, every printer has their own mark. His mark is the olive tree, the man and the olive tree. Um, beautifully printed, 1559. And in his institutes, Calvin, you know, does the four books, right? God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit, and the church, right? And baptism is part of what he deals with as he goes through these different parts of the faith. But I want to tell you the story of this book. I think I still have time to do this because people often ask us, like, how did you get this book? How, how does it come to you? How does it, something that's published in 1559, how is it in Grand Rapids, Michigan in 2023, right? How does that happen exactly? I often wish the books could talk. I often wish they could tell me how they got from one place to the next. We know part of the story of this particular book. And just because it's a cool story, I'm going to tell it to you. So, in the 1970s, in Grand Rapids, there was a pastor, and he liked going to secondhand bookstores. That was his hobby. Okay. So, he went to a bookstore, secondhand bookstore in Grand Rapids, and he went through their old books, right, looking to see what there was. And he found one, and the cover was like the Boys' Own Annual of 1899 or something, like an old magazine cover. Uh huh. He opened it up. It wasn't this, it was that, right? It was the Institutes. Right? The man nearly fell over. Right? He was just stunned. He went to the man at the counter and he said, you have something very valuable here, you should you know, take care of it. And the man at the counter kind of nodded. The pastor went away. He came back three weeks later. The book was still there. He took the book. He went to the counter. He said, how much do you want for this? The guy said, well, 20 bucks. 
right? <laughs> the pastor gave him 50. The pastor then donated the book to Calvin College. And in return, Calvin College paid for that man and his wife to have a free trip to the Netherlands to thank them for giving us this book, right? Okay. The story doesn't end there. Um, this, is, this is Calvin. We're kind of connected, right? So in about the year 2000, Paul Fields received a letter from this very same pastor, still going, okay? And he said, you don't know me, but years ago in the 1970s, I donated this book, and I wonder what happened to it, and so on. And Paul wrote back and said, yeah, we have the book. We tell the story, and so on. And the man wrote again. He said, well, thank you for telling me. You know, things are going well for me and my wife, and we're all good. So here's a check for the same amount that Calvin gave us back in 1970 to go to the Netherlands, and you can have it to buy more rare books. Isn't that cool? It's just like, that's just an amazing story, right? But we don't know how the book got to Grand Rapids, how somebody plonked a, you know, old cover on it. Maybe that's what they had lying around. They thought this will be a good cover for the book. We don't know that, right? So it's just fascinating to think about the trajectory of these works. All right, so I'm going to give you like five minutes. You want to come and look at some of the books, talk to us about some of the items we have on baptism. That would be fine. Then you've got a break, and we start up here again uh, at about 10, 10.30. Is our next one? Okay, yep, we got time. Great. Come and have a look. Come and have a look.